Welcome to Little Steps Big Gains in episode two of our series on upper limb ataxia, clinical characteristics. While cerebellar ataxia has such a variety of atypical manifestations, in this video, we're gonna talk about some of the major clinical characteristics. And then why do we see those? That's gonna play a huge role in understanding why we'll be doing the treatment interventions in our second series on treatment of upper limb ataxia. But here are some of the top clinical characteristics we might see. First, dysmetria. Dysmetria is basically an over or under shooting of a target. This might be in the limbs, but also the eyes. And we're gonna talk about the clinical application and the manifestation of what happens when we have dysmetria and over or under shooting from the eyes as well. Second is tremor. Now tremor is a really big umbrella term. You can have a resting tremor, often seen in Parkinson's disease, or an action tremor, where the tremors kick in with action. We have a whole episode on tremors if you're interested next. However, with cerebellar ataxia, we see more of an action tremor, and specifically under that, an intention tremor where the tremor kicks in and gets larger, the closer we get to an intended target. We may see truncal ataxia. This is proximally at the trunk with some oscillations. We might see hypotonia. What is that and how does it apply? Well, our muscles have a general resting level of tension, and that's important because that level of tension gives information to the brain about where the joints proximally closer to the body and distally away from the body where those joints are in space. Now the motor neuron responsible for the tension of our muscles is the gamma motor neuron. You're know, like, why is that important? Well, the cerebellum is responsible for modulating gamma motor neurons. So if we struggle with that modulation, we will get what's called hypo, uh, which is less um, tonia, less tone in the muscle, a lengthening. Now that is applicable because then we are lacking the information about where the joints are proximally and distally, a lacking proprioception. A better um, application would be like in the knees. So we have the muscles from the hips to the knees. If we have hypotonia, a lack of tension in those muscles, the brain's not getting as much information about where the knees are in space. So to compensate people with ataxia, ataxians often, they lock their knees and it lock those knees to compensate. So if I have individuals do something called um, seesaw knees, sometimes a slight bend in the knee and they'll quickly buckle because of the lack of proprioception there. That's a clinical manifest air application. Next, we often see ocular motor impairments. That is the coordination of the muscles around the eyes. And that's so important because that gives information to the brain so that it can coordinate the limbs, right? We need that accurate information coming in. So going back to that dysmetria, clinical application would be when we go to reach, and we'll talk about this later, okay? When we go to reach for an object, initially we get this central motor command system that sends the information through the limb, but it stops just short of the target because that final um, set of movements actually is where the eyes kick in to help, more of a visually directed movement where they work together. The eyes jump to the target first, so the limb goes, and then the eyes need to work together with the limb to make that movement precise. If we have ocular motor impairments where we're over or under shooting the target and we're having a hard time giving the brain accurate information, we're gonna have a hard time with that final precision. This is why some individuals tend to do better with their eyes closed, and we'll talk about that. Next, we have something called dysarthria. That is slurred speech. We'll talk about that. Diadococinesia, big, big word, but difficulty with rapid alternating movements. We'll break that down. Dysynergia, and then grasping deficits. Those are some of the most common clinical characteristics we see. Now let's break some of them down. Jumping back, diadococinesia, really big, big word. It's very simple though. It basically, basically means impaired rapid alternating movements. So this is why clinicians uh, will often have a patient put one hand out and have their other hand rapidly supinate and pronate back and forth maybe screwing in a light bulb simulating that, 
maybe tapping the table or having them take one heel and slide it down the opposite shin. Now, what are clinicians looking for? Well, they're looking for a dissociation in the timing and the force of the muscle contractions. And Ellie's gonna give us a visual demonstration of these. Why, this is what we really wanna dig deep together. Why do we see that dissociation in the time and the force? Well, jump back with me. You can close your eyes and imagine that image of our first, when we were talking about the, um, the role of the cerebellum, we were talking about the functional subdivisions, right? Right down the middle of the cerebellum, we have the spinocerebellum. That part resp is responsible for executing our movements. On the sides, remember, we have the cerebrocerebellum. Sounds like a lot of information, but hang in there with me. Basically, what we need to know is that part of the cerebellum plays a role in timing our movements and the force of the movement. So if we have a damage or degeneration to the cerebrocerebellum, that part of it, we're going to struggle with the timing and the force of muscle contractions. That is why. Let's look at Ellie as she can give us a visual demonstration of some movements of diadochokinesia. Often individuals um, have a hard time timing the initiation and the termination of movement or that turning point. And then think about it, how rapid it has to be. Because it's so rapid, the brain is not getting that afferent feedback very fast. So much information for it to try to coordinate in such a small amount of time. So those are some reasons why we might see that really big word, diadochokinesia. Basically, it's impaired, rapid, alternating movements dysynergia. All these big words, but hang in there. I know that you can break these down with me. This big word, basically, it means any disturbance in muscle coordination. That's it. So when it comes to movement, we have this like baton action, okay, where the proximal muscle groups, they kick in first, okay, when we go to reach. Kick in, they then like send the baton, you might say, to the next muscle group and the next muscle group so that they can all work together. When we reach, it's not like we start down here, right? We start here. So if we have a hard time coordinating one muscle group to the next, we're gonna have that disturbance in muscle coordination. Now, not only that, but the cerebellum plays a huge role in predicting our movements ahead of time. Strange, right? But when you go to reach, not only do you need to know where your limb currently is, but you kinda gotta know where it's gonna go. And the cerebellum, that's its role, predicting the next movement. So if we have damage or degeneration to the cerebellum, we're gonna struggle with that. So that is why it's really common for dyssynergic patients that lack of coordination to take a big movement and break it down into several smaller movements. Grasping deficits. Grasping is a really big task and we need to break it down together into smaller components and analyze them so we can truly understand cerebellar ataxia. So first component is the hand transport, transporting the hand towards the object. Now think about it, once we're there, we need the grasp type selection. What type of grasp is needed and custom for that object? Once we get that, we need the grasp force selection, the calibration. What is the force that is required specific to that object? Those are the three components. Let's look at Ellie. She's going to do some great grasping activities, and then let's hear from the ataxia community. As clinicians, what are we specifically looking for custom to cerebellar ataxia, those specific manifestations, and why do we see those? Let's break it down together. So first off, dysmetria, an over or under shooting for the target. Dysynergia, we just talked about that. But instead of having one nice smooth movement, we're breaking it down into several smaller movements. Tremor, we may be okay at rest, but as soon as we start to reach for that target during the hand transport phase, suddenly the tremor kicks in and it gets bigger the closer we get to the target, an intention tremor. 
ocular motor impairments. We're looking for the coordination of the eye muscles. Because remember, when we reach, the eyes have to jump to the target accurately because the limb itself actually cuts us short. And then during the final phase, that's when the vision jumps in to help make our movements nice and precise. Those eyes also need to coordinate to track moving objects, come together for our depth perception. So there's a lot of things our eyes have to coordinate to help the limb. We may, and we're looking for a prolong in the grasp formation time. In other words, the time it takes to select the correct grasp. Remember our functional subdivisions of the cerebellum and how part of it takes a role that down the middle of the spinal cerebellum in executing the correct movements. And then impaired grip calibration, the amount of force required and the timing of that force. The cerebrocerebellum in those functional subdivisions, this is some of the applications and the things we're looking for. Impaired grip, the time it takes to formate, formulate that grasp, and then the calibration, the force scaling specific for that object. Now that's for stationary targets. When it comes time for grasping moving targets, we have two types. We have a reactive control. So this would be as with, for with Ellie, she puts her hand out and I drop an object and her ability to react, react and catch it. And then we have a predictive control, okay? This would be as if she took the object, put it over her own hand and then, gra and then caught it with a predictive control. So what do you think is a little bit more difficult for individuals with cerebellar ataxia? Reactive? where she's catching it when I drop it, or predictive, where she's catching it when she drops it. Let's take a look together and see. Did you guess correctly? We have a harder time predicting our movements. And why is that? Well, that was your quiz. Remember the cerebellum plays a huge role in predicting our movements ahead of time. Now that we learned about some of the most common clinical characteristics and manifestations we see with cerebellar ataxia, and then why we see those, now that we went through that, let's hear from the ataxia community. Let's learn from them. I wanted to learn, so I asked different support groups. I said, what are some upper extremity tasks that you personally find difficult? And here are some of their responses. Picking up a wine glass, writing on a whiteboard, pouring water or milk, carrying a glass without spilling it, inserting my credit card into a machine, cutting meat, interacting with those touch screen kiosks they have in airports, narrowing in on an object and close my hands with equal pressure between my thumb and my fingers to pick up an object. I have problems to know the distance between the objects. Instead of putting my plate on the counter, I drop it on the floor thinking that the counter is close. Grabbing things too hard or too weak and dropping straight away. Or if I'm holding something for a while, my sensation and intention to hold it relaxes and I drop things out of nowhere. The grip, the push, the pull, I have a difficult time managing my feel. Sometimes because the pressure is uneven, objects flip right outside my grasp. Delayed timing, my timing is off. I can't cinch my grasp around things that require two hands. Sometimes when I try to pick up things, but most often half an instant after picking up as my fingers try to cope with the grip commands that my brain is sending. Coordination between brain and hands. I think I'm cueing my fingers to release while hovering over a waistband, but the fingers don't release until the hand is no longer over the bin. And those are some of the real life functional applications of what we just learned about the top most common clinical characteristics of ataxia and why we see those things. We can put it all together. I hope that you found this episode interesting on the common clinical characteristics of ataxia. I found it interesting too. If you did find it educational, insightful, informative, please press the like that's right below this video button there. Subscribe to my channel and then share these free resources with others.
I also have this platform called Patreon where you can go ahead and support these free educational videos. Now, if you're wondering, well, what can I do about these clinical characteristics? I have ataxia. Our next series is on the treatment of upper limb ataxia, but this video and this series on the evaluation really plays a great foundation for the treatment, understanding why those treatment interventions do and could help. So finish this series with me. Next, we'll talk about tremors and then screening tools followed up by standardized testing. I do hope that you stay tuned for those episodes. Check out other free educational videos and free home exercise programs that can really help with the taxi and other neurological conditions that are free here on Little Steps, Big Gains.